fun as we continue to wrap up our second week of the MCIC series. The MCIC series is a virtual conference series throughout the month of March hosted by the Department of Campus Climate. Although we have had a lot of other partnerships helping us get here and also along the way. Soon, um, Kaden will be linking our community standards for the MCIC series in the chat. We do expect folks to read through these community standards and also to abide by them. Most importantly, I will ask that at this time you mute your microphone and, mute, and keep it muted when you're not speaking throughout the presentation. This reduces background noise and is respectful to the presenters and participants in this space. We will have closed captioning available through all of the sessions for our MCIC series. You should see some live captioning happening now at the bottom of your screen in a dark gray box. If you do not, please follow the steps indicated below. So choose either the CC button or perhaps the more button at the bottom of your screen and click view live, trans live transcript. If you're having any difficulties with this, please message Kaden or myself in the Zoom chat. Also a heads up, we are going to be recording most of our sessions for the MCIC series. This is being done to make the sessions as accessible as possible for those who cannot attend live and may want to watch recording later. Additionally, the MCIC series is only of the live sessions are only available to the UW Platteville institution. And so these recordings make it accessible to those outside of our institution. We will be posting the recordings to our Campus Climate YouTube channel in about three business days after the live session occurs. If you have questions, comments, or concerns at any time about this session or the MCIC series in general, please utilize the Zoom chat function. We also have someone monitoring our Campus Climate email address throughout this session as well. And now I would like to introduce Natasha Geyer. Natasha Geyer is a disability specialist for services for students with disabilities at the University of Wisconsin Platteville. She is facilitating Disability Dialogues, which is a four part series that focuses on examining perceptions around disability and disability identity. The series will involve discussions centered around issues faced by the disability community. And today's topic is disability identity and apparent disabilities. I will now turn things over to Natasha. Thank you, Emily. Just give me a moment to share my screen. Okay, thank you. So today we will be focusing on disability identity development, um, specifically for individuals with apparent disabilities. Um, this is building a bit on what we covered in the first session, but you do not need to have attended the first session to um, get it, um, stuff out of this session to understand what's going on. Um, we're going to look at how society's perceptions of disability impact disability identity development, examine perspectives of disabled folks, look at how disabled people are portrayed, um, and how we as a society can shift our perspectives on disability. Um, the disability community is very diverse, and I do not by any means represent or speak for the entire disability community. And the information I present today was gathered through research, interactions with the disability community, and my experiences working with disabled folks. I want to point out that I do say we a lot in this discussion, and when I'm saying that, I mean we as a society in general, not specifically the members of this group, myself, or the university. So I do not want to just talk to you for a full hour. I want to encourage active participation and I want everyone to participate as you feel comfortable doing so. 
um, ways you can participate are you can raise your hand or unmute yourself to speak. Um, if you want to use the raise hand function, uh, that is under the reactions button. If you click on the reactions, which is like a little uh, smiley face emoji, um, you can click raise hand. Um, you can use the chat feature either publicly or privately to ask questions or to respond. Um, you can use your um, annotate option to write answers when we use the whiteboard, and you can always use the Zoom reactions found under that little emoji icon. So the first thing I want to do is just kind of take a quick look at what it means to have an identity. What does it mean to identify as a member of a community? Um, we all have many facets to our individual identities. Um, so we're going to do a little thought exercise. Um, so I want you to think of a facet of your identity. Um, could be gender, race, ethnicity, religion, ability, etc. And then I'm going to have Emily pull up the whiteboard. And I want you to put on there or in the chat or um, mute, unmute yourself um, and put that identity and how it makes you feel. So how does identifying as um, whatever you've chosen make you feel. So I will stop my share and let Emily pull that whiteboard up and I'll give you a minute or two to put your answers in. And if you want to write on the whiteboard, um, at the top of your screen, you'll see a little green box. It says you are viewing Emily Steyer's screen and then there's a view options button and the little uh, drop down carrot. Um, you can select annotate and that will bring up a little toolbar. If you use the T for text, that will bring up a text box and you can type. You can use the stamps, you can use the pen to draw, um, however it works best for you to interact with the whiteboard. And the whiteboard is anonymous, by the way, so we won't see your name next to whatever you contribute. And if you are viewing through Whova, you may not be able to interact with the whiteboard. So do feel free to either put that information in the chat or unmute yourself and let us know if you feel comfortable doing that. So I'm seeing some answers come in here. I'm seeing faith, fulfilled, mother proud, college graduate proud, depression and anxiety has helped me become an advocate for mental health resources, African-American proud, woman strong, Christian sense of comfort, comfort, duty to love others, uh, androgynous, beautiful, academic community, sense of belonging, invigorating, a sense of passion, Transgender, it gives me a word to describe my lived experience and also a word to connect me with others with similar experiences. Crafter, creative. So I'm seeing a pattern here. What pattern are you seeing about um, not necessarily the identities that you've chosen, but the feelings you have about those identities? What pattern is happening here? Well, just along the the thought of community that sense of community that sense of belonging that's a great answer so it gives you a sense of community a sense of belonging molly put in the chat that they're all positive right we all feel good about these identities that we've decided to share so let me go back to my screen here okay um does how that identity that you chose, how it's viewed by society and portrayed in the media, does that affect your feelings about that identity? Does anyone want to share? I think that, oh, sorry, this is Brittany. Um, my answer was being African-American and proud. Um, and I think the media uh, outlets portray it as something that is negative. Um, I also think that there are positive aspects, but mostly it's negative, but that doesn't really affect how I feel about it just because I have a community I can go back to who makes me feel that, uh, like it makes me have a sense of black pride. So, um, 
sometimes I do feel like I'm an outsider or an outlier um, because of the way that the media portrays it. But ultimately, I know that there are other people that look like me, so I'm not alone. Thank you for sharing that, Brittany. Yeah, if your identity um, isn't portrayed in the media or viewed by other folks as a positive thing, um, that can sometimes affect how your identity develops or how you feel about that identity or whether you're willing to kind of share that identity. So what does it mean to have a positive identity? Um, your self-perception and sense of identity helps guide you towards what to do and what to value and how to behave in those situations where that identity stands out, as well as in those situations where it's not salient. So a positive identity is possessing a positive sense of yourself, feeling a connection to and solidarity with the community, like Brittany mentioned. Um, and a positive identity helps adapt and navigate social stretch, stresses and hassles, right? You have an idea of that identity and how you should act, and therefore you can kind of call on that when you're in a stressful situation. So I'll focus on disability identity development and sort of the process of um, developing an identity as a dis disabled person. So the first status is the acceptance status. Um, you either have a disability, you're born with that, or it's acquired. Um, you accept your own disability and your family and friends accept your disability. Beyond that is the relationship status. So you meet other disabled folks, um, you communicate with them and you learn the ways of the group. That's followed by the adoption status where you adopt the shared values of the group. And then the engagement status where you become a role model, you help others that share that status with you and you give back to your community. Um, so I wanna focus on how society's perception of disability might hinder the development of a positive disability identity. Um, and I specifically wanna shift focus at this point to apparent disabilities and take a deeper dive into some of the microaggressions we talked about last time and how they affect individuals with apparent disabilities and their identity development. Um, so what are apparent disabilities? Basically, they are a visible disability, a, a disability that is readily noticeable by either sight, sound, or the person's actions. Um, most often, these are physical disabilities. Um, and when a person has an apparent disability, others automatically identify them as disabled. And it's often assumed by others that that's their only identity or that's the only identity that we see. Um, so whether they want it as a label or not, people with apparent disabilities often have that identity thrust upon them. Um, and uh, as often happens to people with marginalized identities, it's often the only identity that society notices. So it becomes problematic if we only see a person's disability identity and we don't recognize other facets of that identity. When we only see a person's disability, we, it often leads us to only see what we think they can't do. So I want to take a moment to ask, what assumptions do you see society making about disabled folks, specifically folks with apparent disabilities? Um, so think about your own perceptions, how disabled people are portrayed in the media. Um, and these can be assumptions about jobs, romantic relationships, education, and independence. Um, so does anyone have any examples of um, assumptions that society makes? Jason put in the chat, incapable. This is Aaron. Uh, some of the assumptions often seem to be that someone with a visible disability won't uh, be in a romantic relationship and like lead to having children, won't have um, a successful, like fulfilling job, different things like that. Yeah, th those are great examples. Emily put in the chat, not sexual. So when we make these assumptions, what does that lead to um, for us as a society and for disabled folks? What sort of perception does that end up putting us at? Uh, 
Amanda wrote, may not live independently, right? Dependent on other people. Um, and kind of the perception that I think that leads us to as a society is that um, being disabled is such a bad, all-consuming thing that we find it amazing that uh, disabled people can do anything at all, can function um, sort of as an adult um, like we would. Um, and I see that Nathan put in the chat, they are less than. And so we talked about this microaggression, this inspiration microaggression in the last session, and I really want to explore it further. Um, and I have a quote here from a disabled blogger, and she wrote, those without a disability expect us to stay home and not do anything with our lives. Throughout the years, I was told how inspirational I was for going out and doing certain things. How am I inspirational for going out and doing something I want to? Truth is, I'm not. I'm just a regular person. Um, so the question is, are disabled people inspiring for doing everyday things? Um, certainly, they're often portrayed that way in uh, news articles, um, in the media. And there's actually a term for this. And that is called inspiration porn. And inspiration porn is the portrayal of people with disabilities as inspirational solely or in part on the basis of their disability. And this term was actually coined by Stella Young. And I thought about uh, how I would best describe it to you. And I decided that I couldn't do better than Stella. So I have a, a little TED talk uh, of Stella Young kind of talking us through um, inspiration porn. I grew up in a very small country town in Victoria. Uh, I had a very normal, low-key kind of upbringing. Uh, you know, I went to school, I hung out with my friends, I fought with my younger sisters. It was all very normal. And when I was 15, a member of my local community approached my parents and wanted to nominate me for a community achievement award. And my parents said, mm, that's really nice, but there's kind of one glaring problem with that. She hasn't actually achieved anything. <laughs> yeah, uh, and they were right, you know, I went to school, I got good marks, I had a very low key after school job in my mum's hairdressing salon, and I spent a lot of time watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Dawson's Creek. Yeah, I know, what a contradiction. But they were right, you know, I wasn't doing anything that was out of the ordinary at all. Um, I wasn't doing anything that could be considered an achievement if you took disability out of the equation. Years later, I was on my second teaching round in a Melbourne high school. And I was about 20 minutes into a year 11 legal studies class uh, when this boy put up his hand and said, hey, miss, when are you going to start doing your speech? And I said, what speech? You know, I'd been talking to them about defamation law for a good 20 minutes. And uh, he said, you know, like your motivational speaking. You know, when people in wheelchairs come to school, they usually say, like, inspirational stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's usually in the big hall. <laughs> and that's when it dawned on me. This kid had only ever experienced disabled people as objects of inspiration. We are not, you know, to this kid, and it's not his fault. I mean, that's true for many of us. You know, for lots of us, disabled people are not our teachers or our doctors or our manicurists. We're not real people. We are there to inspire. Um, and in fact, you know, I'm sitting on this stage, looking like I do, in this wheelchair, and you are probably kind of expecting me to inspire you, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you dramatically. I'm not here to inspire you. I'm here to tell you that we have been lied to about disability. Yeah, we've been sold the lie that disability is a bad thing. Capital B, capital T. It's a bad thing. 
and to live with disability makes you exceptional. It's not a bad thing and it doesn't make you exceptional. And in the past few years, we've been able to propagate this lie even further via social media. You know, you may have seen images like this one. The only disability in life is a bad attitude. Mm. Or this one, your excuse is invalid, indeed. Or this one, before you quit, try. Yeah. These are just a couple of examples, but there are a lot of these images out there. You know, you might have seen the one, the little girl with no hands, drawing a picture with a pencil held in her mouth. Uh, you might have seen a child running on carbon fibre prosthetic legs. Um, and these images, you know, there are lots of them out there. They are what we call inspiration porn. <laughs> and I use the term porn deliberately because it, they objectify one group of people for the benefit of another group of people. So in this case, we're objectifying disabled people for the benefit of non-disabled people. The purpose of these images is to inspire you, to motivate you, so that we can look at them and think, well, however bad my life is, it could be worse. I could be that person. But what if you are that person? I've lost count of the number of times that I've been approached by strangers wanting to tell me that they think I'm brave or inspirational. And this was long before my work had any kind of public profile. They were just kind of congratulating me for managing to get up in the morning and remember my own name. <laughs> and it, it is objectifying. These images, these images objectify disabled people for the benefit of non-disabled people. You know, they are there so that you can look at them and think that things aren't so bad for you, to put your worries into perspective. And life as a disabled person is actually somewhat difficult. We do overcome some things. But the things that we're overcoming are not the things that you think they are. They are not things to do with our bodies. Uh, I use the term disabled people quite deliberately because I subscribe to what's called the social model of disability, which tells us that we are more disabled by our bodies, by our, the society that we live in rather, than by our bodies and our diagnoses. So I have, uh, I've lived in this body a long time. I'm quite fond of it. It, it, uh, it does the things that I need it to do and I've learnt, I've learnt to use it to the best of its capacity, just as you have. And that's the thing about those kids in those pictures as well. They're not doing anything out of the ordinary. They are just using their bodies to the best of their capacity. So is it really fair to objectify them in the way that we do, to share those images? Uh, people mean, people, when they say, you know, you're an inspiration, they mean it as a compliment. They mean it as a compliment. And I know why it happens. It's because of the lie. It's because we've been sold this lie that disability makes you exceptional. And it honestly doesn't. And I know what you're thinking. You know, I'm up here bagging out inspiration. And you're thinking, geez, Stella, aren't you inspired sometimes by some things? And the thing is, I am. I learn from other disabled people all the time. I'm learning not that I'm luckier than them, though. I am learning that it's a genius idea to use a pair of barbecue tongs to pick up things that you drop. <laughs> I'm learning that nifty trick where you can charge your mobile phone battery from your chair battery. <laughs> genius. We are learning from each other strength and endurance, not against our bodies and our diagnoses, but against a world that exceptionalises and objectifies us. I really think that this lie that we've been sold about disability is the greatest injustice. Um, it, is, it, makes life, it makes life hard for us. Um, the, and that quote, the only disability in life is a bad attitude, the reason that that's bullshit <laughs> is because it's just not true. Because of the social model of disability, you know, no amount of smiling at a flight of stairs has ever made it turn into a rap. Never. <laughs> you 
you know, smiling at a television screen isn't going to make closed captions appear for people who are deaf. You know, no amount of standing in the middle of a bookshop and radiating a positive attitude is going to turn all those books into braille. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Um, I really want to live in a world where disability is not the exception but the norm. I want to live in a world where a 15-year-old girl sitting in her bedroom watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer isn't referred to as achieving anything because she's doing it sitting down. I want to live in a world where we don't have such low expectations of disabled people that we are congratulated for getting out of bed and remembering our own names in the morning. I want to live in a world where we value genuine achievement for disabled people. And I want to live in a world where a kid in year 11 in a Melbourne high school is not one bit surprised that his new teacher is a wheelchair user. Disability doesn't make you exceptional, but questioning what you think you know about it does. Thank you. Okay, I see that Amanda put in the comments, I think is inspiration porn, a new word for me, contributes to imposter syndrome. Amanda, did you want to elaborate on that at all? I don't know that I want to elaborate. Um, what I was thinking is that when, when people tell you that you're an inspiration for any, maybe for anything, maybe not just for disabilities, you sometimes feel like they are expecting more of you than you can provide. Um, that then contributes to this idea that they think you are someone that you don't think you are. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I, I really appreciate that insight. I have never thought of it like that before, but I can definitely see how that would um, contribute to that feeling of imposter syndrome. Uh, Emily wrote, or per perhaps expecting less, and then when you achieve it, it's a surprise, right? So they don't expect a lot out of a person with a disability, and, and so therefore it's shocking when it's achieved. So I have um, some inspiration porn bingo here. So I know we've all read inspiration porn articles, or we've watched news clips, um, right? It's out there, it's everywhere, it's pervasive. Um, and so how can we kind of combat this portrayal of disabled folks? Um, and I think one way is to recognize inspiration porn when we see it. So I have some, some bingo for you when you're consuming your media, reading your newspaper, watching the evening news. Um, and if your article or um, your news story has some of the stuff in it, it might be inspiration porn. Um, so things like she didn't let her disability stop her. He suffers from confined to a wheelchair, the disabled. If you saw her doing whatever, you'd never know she was disabled, defying the odds. Most of us could never imagine, insert horrific impairment, happening to us, but through the miraculous assistance of, and then something completely non-miraculous, uh, courageous battle, and then proving you can achieve anything if you really try. Um, so kind of when you see that sort of thing in the media, um, maybe don't share it. If you're able to call it out, if you know you see someone sharing it and you're able to gently kind of uh, point out why this isn't necessarily a positive portrayal, do that. Um, and then most importantly, do share positive media portrayals of disabled folks. So if you, you see a portrayal of a person with a disability and, and it's not inspiration porn, um, you know, do share that. So why does society ask disabled people to prove their worth? And I think Emily kind of led up to this, right? You're not ex um, perhaps expecting less of a disabled person. And then when they achieve it, it's a surprise. Um, and I have another quote from uh, a disabled blogger who goes by the handle Wheelchair Rapunzel. And she said, I find myself telling people of my accomplishments right away so that they'll accept me and see me as an equal so we can get on with the conversation. So, you know, why, why do we ask individuals with disabilities to prove themselves? Um, I have a privilege that I don't have to prove that I'm the functioning competent adult that I pretend to be when I walk into a room, 
right? Everyone just kind of looks at me and they assume, okay, this is, this is an adult person. Um, if it's a work meeting, this is a professional person. Um, they have certain expectations of me that I don't have to prove I'm capable of the job that I have. Um, but disabled adults often do have to do this because of the infantilism and the helplessness microaggressions that they experience. So another microaggression that we um, briefly touched on last time, and I want to explore further, is desexualization. Um, people with disabilities are often presumed to be asexual. Um, and I have another great quote um, from a, another disabled blogger. People already expect me to be a virgin because I'm disabled, like medical professionals. I've encountered a few instances where I wasn't asked about being sexually active or it, it was presumed I wasn't at a doctor's visit. Um, and that blogger's name is Alex Stacy. Um, why do we presume that people with disabilities are asexual or not sexually active? And Emily clarified, asexual means having little to no desire for sex. So brief description, thank you. There's, this is Molly. Hi. Um, there's probably multiple reasons for that. Um, one being, like, are folks capable of having sex, like, physically? But also, I think there's that underlying, of, like, who would want to have sex with a disabled person? Or it would be creepy to want to have sex with a disabled person. So I think there, there's a multitude of things that are probably going into that perception. Thanks, Molly. I think you hit the nail right on the head, right? There's that, that spread effect, thinking that disability permeates all aspects of your life. So are, are disabled people even capable of having sex? Um, sometimes it's infantilism, right? Uh, we treat oftentimes people with apparent disabilities um, as they are children. And so obviously we don't want to think about children having sex because that's not good. Um, but these are adults. Um, and then Molly made a good point that um, yeah, about being capable um, and part of this sort of desexualization of disabled people is, sorry, can't click today, the per, is perpetuated by mainstream ideas about sex. So sex in the media is usually portrayed in one way, and that's with skinny, straight, white, able-bodied folks. Um, I think as a society, we're getting better on the first three, um, but I don't think we've made any progress on it being between able-bodied folks. So we need to get away from the idea that intimacy can only be achieved one way, the way it's portrayed in the media. And so how do we do that? And how we would do that is we need to work on disabled or normalizing disabled bodies. So I have two photos here. Um, they were both posted on Instagram, so they were posted publicly. The one on the right is Kim Kardashian, um, and she's laying on a bed, and she's got a sheet kind of covering part of the lower half of her body, and she's covering her nipples with her fingers. The one on the left-hand side is a young woman with a disability doing the same pose, um, pretty much, um, but her body isn't the idealized female body. So what is the difference between these two photos? Other than obviously they're not the same person. Is one good and one bad? I will tell you that one was removed from Instagram for violating the nudity and pornography standards, and one wasn't. Does anyone want to guess which one was deleted and which one was left up? Emily said, not Kim's. Yes, Emily, you are right. Uh, the one on the left was removed, reported, and the one on the right was left up. Why is one allowed and not the other? Why is one okay and the other one not okay? And to take it a step further, how do you feel about these photos? How do you feel when you see these photos? And I see in the chat, Teresa says, the main difference seems to be if it was designed for a traditional cis male audience's expectations. Excellent point, Teresa, right? That gets us back to like the mainstream media's portrayal of sex.
So I just want to point out that my point in posting these photos wasn't, I know people may be uncomfortable because they're kind of, you know, slightly nudity, um, not to make you uncomfortable, but to point out that either they're both not okay, right? Like they're both against the rules and they are not allowed, or they're both okay. It can't be one or the other. So I want to take a second to focus on how disabled people are portrayed in the media. So I'm going to stop sharing and have Emily pull up the whiteboard. And I want to just brainstorm together um, some examples of disabled characters in film and television. So you can um, put them there on the whiteboard using the annotate feature or type them in the chat or just unmute yourself and uh, let us know some of them. So just kind of brainstorm and come up with some disabled characters from film and television. So I see we have Drake when he was on Degrassi, Artie from Glee, Forrest Gump, The Good Doctor, Autism, Another Good Doctor. Um. Actors in movies like Girl Interrupted, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, etc. Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. Main character from film Hush is deaf. So now I want you to think about the actors who play these characters. What do they all have in common? And I should say, I don't, I've never heard of the film Hush, so I don't know if this is true of the, that character, but all the other ones, I'm pretty certain. Yeah, <clears throat> I was gonna say what Aaron said, like most, if not all, are, you know, aren't, don't have a, a disability. Right, most of those actors are not disabled. And so I'm gonna go back to my screen here. Ninety-five percent of disabled characters are played by non-disabled actors. So I have a couple examples here as well. I have um, the main character from Avatar, uh, and then I have um, the film Me Before You. Um, and I love how both of these movie posters like cut off the person's wheelchair because you know that that would not be a nice thing to have on your movie poster. It might make people feel uncomfortable. Uh, there is Eddie Redmayne portraying Stephen Hawking, uh, Artie from Glee, who someone mentioned on the whiteboard, and then I have uh, Leonardo DiCaprio from What's Eating Gilbert Grape. Um, and then look at these characters, if you've seen these films before, and think about how are these characters portrayed? Molly, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was going to say, like, this is a very thought provoking exercise. It's like, imagine if we did that for like folks of color. We're we, not and we by, used to, right? Black right. was a thing and it's not anymore. But how is this still, still acceptable? And like, just the fact that like representation for folks with disabilities, like all these movies are about people with disabilities, almost all of them. So like just seeing normal folks like people doing normal things. Yeah, there, there's so many levels that this is, wow. Yeah, Erin, you have your hand up. Yes, um, this is assuming I remember Avatar correctly, but if I remember correctly, he's able to be in like that simulation thing and then is aspiring to be able to like walk and do those types of things again. So the whole thing is that like his current state of, of having to, to use a wheelchair is not, good enough and he needs to be in that that different mobility space again where he can walk around and ambulate um so that was one thing that caught my eye i've not 
uh, personally watched Me Before You, but I have heard of the plot for that. And that sounds incredibly depressing as to how they depict um, that specific movie. Yeah, Aaron makes a great point. In both Avatar and Me Before You, um, being a wheelchair user is depicted as something that these characters do not want to be. Um, and Avatar, he, I think at the end, it's been a long time since I've seen Avatar, can make the choice to leave his, his human body for his Avatar body, which is able-bodied, and he makes that choice. And then in Me Before You, if you've never seen it, um, and I actually have chosen not to watch this movie, but I've read about it, um, the, the character that Sam Clayton plays, um, has a, a disability, he's not born with it, it's an acquired disability, and ultimately he chooses um, to end his life rather than to live with the disability. Um, and uh, if we look at uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in What's Eating Gilbert Grape, um, I think the portrayal of him in that movie, um, he's, a, he's portrayed as a bit of a burden, right? His older brother, played by Johnny Depp, can't go out and, and have an adult life. He can't leave his brother behind. Um, so he is kind of portrayed as, as being burdensome to his family. Um, and then I want to point out that when disabled actors are hired to play a role, the role is often, right, the disability. They're, they're not being hired to play like a role for uh, just any man in his 30s or any woman in her 40s or like a mom. It's always a role that's specifically about this disability. And so that brings me into some, some different tropes that we see in the media about disability. And one of the most pervasive one is villainous disability. So um, either that disability in and of itself equals villainy. So for example, um, in Shakespeare's Richard III, it really goes back that far. Um, Richard III is portrayed as being evil because he's disabled. Um, in uh, or disability is a consequence of evil. So if we look at Darth Vader or Captain Hook, um, you know, they did bad things, they uh, became disabled. Or the use of physical deformities to make villains look scary. Um, how many villains have scars on their face? Like even in Lion King, right? The, there's a scar to make scar look um, scary. And some examples I have are, are Two-Face in Batman um, in the character of Ephelades in 300. He's the, the hunchbacked character who ultimately betrays the 300. Um, or that mental illness equals villainy. So for example, the Joker and Batman. Batman's notorious for having a lot of disability tropes. Um, another disability trope is that a person with a disability is a victim or they're helpless. Um, so for example, Tiny Tim. Um, of course, there's the inspirational disability, like Forrest Gump, um, or that a person with a disability has superpowers, like Daredevil. Oftentimes, because the roles for characters with disabilities are, um, it's the disability, the characters are often one-dimensional, right? There's not a lot of diversity. They're straight, white, cisgender, like Professor X from the X-Men. There's the trope that um, you can throw off disability or overcome disability. Um, so you can get better and your life can be good again. Uh, for example, Luke Skywalker, right? He, he loses his hand, he gets a, a mechanical one and it's never talked about again. Uh, Mikey from the Goonies, at the end of the Goonies, he pulls out his inhaler and he throws it away. Like having, having been brave, he has now defeated asthma. That's not how that works. Um, or for example, Matthew in Downton Abbey, he was had, um, sort of a spinal cord injury um, in World War I, um, was using a wheelchair, and then just suddenly it got better um, and he could walk again. And then the last trope is um, if you grew up in the 80s and 90s watching sitcoms, uh, you'll probably recognize this is a very special episode, uh, right? Uh, disabled character shows up, they inspire us, they teach us a lesson, and then they're never seen on the show again. So those are some kind of not great ways to portray disability. And I mentioned the, the villainous disability trope. Um, and so I pulled up the pictures of the, some of the characters I talked about. And I just want you to, after seeing these, what message is this sending you about disability? that it means you're bad, Aaron said. Yeah, 
disability is a result of being a bad person or having a disability makes you a bad person. Uh, Kidden wrote, disability uh, equals evil, that it's bad, it's ugly, et cetera, right? It, it, these people are scary, right? As a child, I was scared of Darth Vader and Captain Hook. Um, and so that permeates out, right? These people with disabilities are scary in the movie. So people in dis with disabilities in real life must also be scary. Um, Trapper wrote, honestly, I never recognized that these characters even had disabilities, right? It's subtle. You don't necessarily realize the messages that, that you're, you're taking in when you consume media. So I don't just wanna focus on the bad. Sometimes we get it right. Um, and so here are some examples of getting it right. And getting it right means inclusive casting. It is hiring disabled actors, not only to play disabled characters, but for other characters as well, right? The character doesn't have to be written as a disabled person for a disabled character to be cast. Um, so some examples are um, going across from top to bottom. We have RJ Mitty um, in Breaking Bad. He has cerebral palsy and um, he was written as the character of Walter White's son and then RJ Mitty was hired and then they said, okay, Walter White's son has cerebral palsy. Uh, the next one is Daryl Mitchell. He is a paraplegic and he uh, plays uh, sort of a crime scene investigator, computer investigator in NCIS New Orleans. Uh, there is Marley Matlin um, in the upper right hand corner um, and she was on West Wing. Um, she played um, someone who did political polls. But she is a deaf woman and so her character was deaf but that's not what her character was about. Uh, I'll also point out that Marley Matlin has an Oscar for the film Children of a Lesser God. Um, on the bottom left there is Micah Fowler. He is in a television show Speechless and he also has cerebral palsy um, and he plays um, uh, the son of uh, one of the main characters who has cerebral palsy. And then my favorite one, um, the last one is Allie Stoker. And this is an image of her uh, playing Ado Annie in Oklahoma on Broadway. Uh, she has a spinal cord injury. She actually won a Tony for this role. But if anyone knows Oklahoma, Rodgers and Hammerstein did not write Ado Annie as a disabled woman, right? She's just a girl who can't say no. Um, so this casting is great because, you know, a girl in a wheelchair can also be a girl who can't say no. Okay, so I have one more screen of some other portrayals that we might see. And I have a poll and I'll launch that here. Are these images positive? What do you think? So you can go ahead and answer the poll. If you can't interact with the poll because you're watching through Whova, you can put yes or no in the chat. So, so far it's looking like most people are saying yes and about a, a third of people are saying no. So give it about 20 more seconds for the poll and then I'll close it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So 71% of people who completed the poll said yes, and 29% said no. Why? Why yes or why no? Erin, go ahead. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna lower my hand. Okay. So one of the things that stands out to me is that for some reason, all but one of these pictures, we don't see a face. So there's no real identity to the folks in these, in these photos. I'm also not understanding why their arms are outstretched, except for the person in the bottom middle photo, because I could just be like really enjoying the sunlight. But unless for some of those like upper photos, they're like super excited that they overcame the fear of getting that close to the edge of something. Um, I don't understand why our arms are outstretched. Um, so those are some of the things I think about. And then there's just like these random backgrounds. I guess I'm not understanding the story as to why we're looking at a picture of this. 
Right. If you Google stock images of a person in a wheelchair, you're going to see a lot of these. Um, and they all have something in common, right? They are all alone. They all have their arms up, like, like they're in triumph because they made it outside. Um, they're not accurate. Uh, if you look at all of these wheelchairs, if you know anything about wheelchair users, those are all the kind of wheelchairs that you would use to like push someone around in a hospital um, for like an hour. Uh, these are not everyday mobility aids. Um, yep, sorry, I just said, they, or said the same thing in the chat. Um, what else about them? They're all white, except for maybe the guy who's in silhouette, we're not sure there. Um, they're all physically attractive um, by traditional beauty standards. Um, more than likely the actors or the models, I guess not actors, are, uh, are able-bodied people, right? They, none of these people have severe physical disabilities. They're all a uh, person who, if you took the wheelchair away, you would not be able to tell that they're disabled. Um, and so this is the negative stereotype. Why are they all alone? Right, disability people who have disabilities don't go out with friends. Uh, why are they all in triumph? Is is that code for something? You know, what what does this mean? Like Aaron said. Um, so if we want to be inclusive, right? We we want to have our stock photos on our websites and our media. You know, be inclusive. We have to look at how we're actually portraying people with disabilities in an inclusive light. Um, these aren't accurate. Um, I don't know anybody able-bodied or not able-bodied who, like Aaron said, just goes outside and you know puts their arms up like that, uh, except for Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet in Titanic. Um, that's really the only time I can think of that that's a natural thing. Um, so when we portray folks with disabilities, we should portray them accurately using the correct mobility aids. Um, Disability permeates all races, genders, ethnicities, so they shouldn't all be white and beautiful. Um, and just portray them doing normal stuff. You know, uh, you know this one in the middle with the, the girl with the braids um, and the pink sweatshirt, if she was in a um, typical wheelchair that a person who uses a wheelchair would use, uh, and she was with someone and they were hiking, then that would be fine. But this is weird and people don't don't go out and do this. Okay, so I do want to, I see we're getting close on time. So I have one more exercise for us. Um, let's see. And just like at the end of the last one. So after having kind of looked at this, looked at how media portrays folks with disabilities, going forward, how might your thoughts, words, or actions change? And I will stop my share and let Emily launch that last whiteboard. So feel free to post in the chat what you might change going forward or put it on the whiteboard or unmute yourself or raise your hand. And then also if you have any questions, um, feel free to throw those in the chat. Either you can uh, put them publicly or send them privately to um, either myself, Kaden, or Emily, or you can raise your hand or unmute yourself if you have a question you'd like to ask. Be careful not to share inspiration porn articles on Facebook. Awesome. We've got a heart on that, so that means someone agrees. Simply pay more attention seeing the stereotypes and my microaggressions around me. Be more aware of objectifying images or inaccurate, I'm assuming that's going to say inaccurate portrayals. Normalize folks with disabilities doing normal folk things. I love that one.
address those microaggressions or stereotypes, not letting it slide. So I'll leave the whiteboard up if you want to continue um, sharing things, but uh, I see Erin has a, her hand raised, so go ahead, Erin. I just wanted to ask real quick, you had uh, used a quote from this person earlier, but is it is it wheelchair Rapunzel? Is yes. that their handle? Yes. Okay, I, I believe I saw some of their stuff on Facebook because of something you've shared before. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I think I would like to do more things like that of following people who are posting um, things that are giving some of those education very in a very real sense because it's some mm -hmm. of their lived experience. And also, if I remember correctly, she's posted a lot of like wonderful and beautiful photos that are very much um, making you have to take that moment of, of realizing, okay, this isn't always what um, like sexy photos, that type of thing can look like and just attractive photos. It doesn't have to be Kim Kardashian because to be honest, I don't want to stare at her photos all the time. <laughs> yes. Um, so getting that, that, that exposure to kind of some more of like other options and open up your mind to like, this isn't what it has to look like just because society shoves it in your face all the time. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out that when I shared the image of, of Kim Kardashian um, and the woman with a disability, that is actually Wheelchair Rapunzel. Um, that's her Instagram, Facebook, social media handle. She has a blog. Um, so yes, definitely check her out. Uh, I actually met her um, by being a counselor at a muscular dystrophy camp. So I have known her for a long time. Um, Someone, someone struggling with the, the annotate, uh, using the, the word disabled instead of treating it like a bad word. Great. Does anyone else have any other questions? I know we're just about right at time. I'm happy to wait a couple extra minutes if anyone has anything they want to ask or share. Okay, everybody's either digesting their lunch at this point or waiting to go to lunch. So <laughs> we're all hungry and tired and ready for our afternoon naps. Uh, so I really appreciate all of you joining. Um, I encourage you to join again next week um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Natasha.